LTV is just a really weird mortgage way of saying deposit size. The headline rates are, are there to drive traffic to websites, yeah. not, not to be on offer to mm. clients. I'd... There's something called buyer's remorse, which when you move into your house, <laughs> if you haven't <laughs> deleted that account, suddenly you get something loads cheaper that's next door. <laughs> There's quite a lot of emotion going on because when yeah. you're buying a house, it's not just... You're not just buying an asset, you're buying a home and you picture what it's going to yeah. be like to live in and you put shelves up and you go to Ikea and work out colour schemes on your Pinterest board. I sometimes describe my job as being like 50% financial advisor and 50% counsellor because yeah. it's so emotive. Buying a house is such an emotional mm. thing. I think a common misconception is that you need three years worth of, of filed yeah. company accounts and it's, it's too old school. Mm. It doesn't work like that anymore. Top um, tips are check your credit file. If you don't have a credit card, take a credit card out, spend a little bit every month, set up a direct debit and clear it in full. Definitely speak to a mortgage broker, understand the mortgage, understand what solicitors do, understand how estate agents work. Hello and welcome to the Corico Couch. I'm delighted to welcome you here for the very first in our new season of episodes. Now, I'm also delighted to be joined today by my special guest and broker to the stars, Mr. Stuart Featherford. Hello, Stuart. Hi, Monty. Thanks Hi. for having me. It's great to have you here. Are you nice and comfy on our, our new Corico Couch? Very comfy, very Good. excited. Love the set. <laughs> I dressed it myself, obviously. No, you didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, so not only is Stu one of our most senior advisors, he also runs our Mortgage Education Service, a program that sees Corico offering mortgage advice to employees and contractors of large and small companies in and around the UK. So, Stu... First of all, we are here to talk about first-time buyers, but I do want to talk about the Mortgage Education Service first, if that's okay. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it and why Why was it important to you to, to actually run this? So once upon a time, I was a very naughty little boy <laughs> um, and my mum was concerned that I would mismanage my money and their money if something was to happen to them. Mm. So from a very young age, I was taught about finance by my mum. Not a lot of people have access to things like that. Yeah. Financial education isn't part of the school curriculum. It's just something I've always been passionate about because I had that as a child. That then went on to develop. I became a mortgage broker and quite quickly we identified that um, companies were being asked by their employees about mortgages about financial education and there was just a huge gap in the market. So what we do, what I do, what you do as well with me is we can go around and we work with many, many different companies from big multinationals all the way down to small companies and we can go in there and pretty much do what they want. Whether they want financial education, we can run first time buyer seminars, a whole range of things. And it's really individual down to that particular mm. company. But I feel like the way the world is moving on, part of the employee benefits offering needs to be something to do with finance. And being born in the UK, we are hardwired to want to buy a, buy yeah, a home. Absolutely. Home ownership is, is massive. I mean, you could look at all of the press, home ownership's huge. The government, whichever government it is, is always is trying to incentivize home ownership because it's so important in the, mm. the UK psyche. No, it's really interesting. I think what I what I found doing it with you is is the 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 knowledge gap that's clearly there. And I think when when we first went into it, coming on to first time buyers, I think we assumed a level of knowledge, didn't we? That, yeah, we did. That actually isn't really there. So, what, so where do you start the presentations now? And what would be what would be your starting point for anyone watching who actually wants to wants to to buy their own home? There is no starting point. You assume people know nothing. I, I, the mortgage journey, home ownership is quite um, appears quite complex from an yeah. outsider's point of view. So what we try and do is break it down to start. So saving for deposit. What actually is a mortgage? How do I go about doing it? How do I buy a house? What do the legal people do? We explain the whole thing. But with the cost of living crisis. The deposit is the first part that people want to learn about. Mm. 
credit files. There's a whole there's a whole minefield, but you can demystify it really, really quickly. Yeah. But saving and deposit, get my credit files sorted. How do I go about getting a mortgage? How do I go about buying a house, registering with a state agent? Which websites are good? So, yeah. you know, your property portals. So let's break some of that down then. Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Into, so, so let's start with the, uh, the what is a mortgage piece and, um, and, and, and start there, which is I guess, the first slide that you, that you present on. Yeah, so uh, a mortgage is a loan. It's, it's very, very simply a loan. It's a loan that is secured against a house. If you're buying a second-hand car, you might borrow £1,000, £2,000, £3,000. So you take that loan over a couple of years and you pay it off every single month. And at the end of the two, three years, you own your motorbike, you own your second-hand car, you don't owe any money to the bank. Mm. A mortgage is exactly the same, but it's a lot more money. So you tend to take it over a much, much longer term. In the olden days, and when I talk about olden days, this is probably parents' age, mortgages were taken over a 20-year lifetime. Now, due to many, many different factors, the mortgages are taken over a much, much longer period of time, mm. sometimes up to 40 years. So it's essentially a loan that is secured against your house that allows you to buy the home. The secured against your house bit is very, very important. And what that means is if for whatever reason you can't pay your mortgage every month, the bank does have a legal recourse to repossess that property. So that is what a secured loan is, yeah. secured against your house. Mm. And you mentioned uh, around the the credit file bit. I yeah. guess that's, that's the first thing that a mortgage lender will check, isn't it? Your credit file. So are there any tips and tricks around what that is and how people can find it and what they can do to improve it? One one thing I get asked a lot is, should I have a credit card or shouldn't I have a credit card? Mm. And I'll come on to that in a minute. But essentially, we work in a, a computerized age. Uh, so when you're looking to borrow tens, hundreds of thousands of pounds from a bank, one of the first things they're going to do is check you are who you say you are, but also your your background, your financial history and mm -hmm. what a credit file is. It's just a document that has all of your financial relationships on it. So your banking relationships, your bills, your credit cards, loans, higher purchases, electricity, and it's all in one document. Then it gets a little bit tricky. Different banks use different credit reference mm -hmm. agencies, but there's yeah. three main ones, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. Some use one, some use two, some use three. Um, but out there, there is a whole platform of many, many different free credit credit files. Um, and you can go on there and check them for free. So Credit Karma, I think at the minute is free, but there are many, many others. Anyone who wants to buy a house should be checking their credit file checking yeah. it, periodically set up alerts because essentially at some point, whether you're looking to buy in the next six months or five years, the first touch point that a bank's going to have with you is to check your credit file. So you need to check all your details are on there. You need to check your name's correct, your address is correct. And it's got all of the financial relationships listed because they can be patchy. They sometimes mm. can require a bit of work. So for you to be able to do all of that work at the start and get your credit file looking good, then when you come to actually apply for a mortgage, that's going to make your life a lot easier. So I've got my credit file looking good. It looks good. It's a 999. Yay. Yeah. Um, what's, the, what's, what's the next? I think I'm going to buy in the next maybe six months. Maybe it's 18 months. How do you, how do you, what do you tell people around saving for a deposit? Uh, so saving for a deposit is pretty much the, the hardest bit. For many, many first-time buyers, we do look to bank of mum and dad or perhaps a bit of inheritance mm -hmm. from somewhere. But the first thing you need to do is look into saving for a deposit. So tax-free savings, ISAs, LISAs, lifetime ISAs. And just set yourself a goal. So if you want to achieve, for example, a 5% deposit, you can say, right, in two or three years' time, I want to have saved up this much money. Then you look at your budget, and it's pretty old school, but all of the apps, all of the banking apps have now got budgeting. So you know what comes into your household every month, and you know what you're spending every month, whether that's on going out, lifestyle, food, debts, and you're left with the net amount. And out of that net amount, you want to be working out what you save every month so you can achieve your savings goal in mm. one, two, three years. And um, a lot of people watching will will sometimes, if, they, if they're looking online, they'll see those three letters LTV or loan to value. Can yeah. you explain what, 
what that is and what how that relates to the deposit. Yeah, LTV is just a really weird mortgage way of saying deposit size. Uh, <laughs> like rather than just yeah. say what deposit have you got, we call it a loan to value. So for example, a 95% loan to value equates to a 5% deposit. Mm. So instead of saying a 5% deposit mortgage, we say a 95% loan to value mortgage. So basically the crude maths is the smaller your deposit, the higher risk you are to a bank. So therefore the higher interest you're going to pay. So the yeah. more expensive your mortgage is going to going to be every five percent additional you put down you get access to slightly lower interest rates so until a few months ago the smallest deposit you needed to buy a property in the uk in a standard format was five percent a 90 percent loan to value mortgage brilliant you can buy a house but your interest rate is going to be a little bit high with 10 percent, it gets a little bit cheaper 15 percent cheaper and over 25 percent, you're pretty much going to get the cheapest mortgages in the market right now so we've just seen our lovely friends over at Accord Building Society release a 99% mortgage. So you put a 1% deposit down or a minimum of £5,000, the bank will lend you the rest of the money mm. and you can buy your house. So basically deposit of £5,000 is, is now the minimum. Yeah, that's the minimum. That's also brand new. So we've mm. also got things like a track record mortgage from Skipton where you don't need any deposit, but they'll look at your rental history. The, the point is there's lots of innovation yeah. happening because cost of living's been high. People are struggling probably a bit more than they were 18 months ago, two years ago to save for a deposit. Innovation's happening. So I would expect a lot more things like this to mm. come out. So if I've got my deposit together, my credit score is good yeah um what's the next stage do i do you advise i go to an estate agent and see a property and put an offer in or or uh, can you talk through that process or yeah. actually in my view and i'm sure it's your view actually the first stage is to talk to an advisor like yourself first i wouldn't just talk to any advisor i'd talk to an award-winning advisor <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh yeah so the, the first thing is you need to get your ducks in a row yeah how much can i borrow how much is it going to cost what are all the fees could i potentially get something called an agreement in principle without having that conversation with a broker first you're shooting in the dark you yeah. don't know how much you can borrow you don't know how much yeah. it's going to cost you every month mm. but a good broker will hold your hand through this whole yeah. process they will teach you how to register with estate agents they will let you know about all the different types of survey yeah. um, they will guide you through the offer process yeah. so two questions are, are from that and one Shoot. is the biggest question mm -hmm. which we all get how much can i borrow Stu? how much can i borrow <laughs> Uh, How much can I borrow? Well, I don't, I've been doing this job like uh, since the dawn of time <laughs> slash about 14 years or something. And it's literally the question I get asked most yeah. because houses are really, really expensive. And basically people want to know what's what's my plip at? How much can I borrow? Olden days, it was very simple. You came to me, you gave me your pay slips. I'd go, ta-da, here's five times your income. Uh, that's that's old news. We don't do that anymore. We do something called an affordability model and each bank will have a separate affordability model. So some banks are quite conservative with what they'll lend you, but they might have really cheap rates. <laughs> Other banks are much more flexible on what they'll lend to you or, or that you can borrow, but they might be a little bit more expensive. And that's why you speak to a broker because it's our job to interplay all of that and go, do you know what? This is the bank that's going to give you what you want at this rate. So mm. I, we're, I'm regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Every bit of advice I give you is regulated. So it is my job to get you the right mortgage and the cheapest mortgage. Sometimes the right mortgage isn't necessarily the cheapest. Mm. Sometimes the cheapest is right. But it's my job to guide you through all of that. So it's all very well looking online and seeing well, that's the cheapest rate, but yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean you'll be able to get that rate, does it? No, for sure. Like online rates, the headline rates are, are there to drive traffic to websites, yeah. not, not to be on offer to mm. clients. And, and what are the type of things that, that mean you can borrow more or less? The gold standard of borrowing is somebody that's very easy to work out. So they're potentially employed. So we get pay slips, which is a very easy metric for an underwriter to, mm. to look at. But for somebody that doesn't have a lot of loans, credit cards, high purchases, outgoings in the background, children right. are very expensive. <laughs> I've got two, yeah. and yes. they're bleeding me dry. I know. Uh, so, <laughs> Wait yeah. till they get to teenagers. Mm, no. <laughs> but yeah, so, so you know, like somebody that's not spending a lot of money on, on other aspects of life. So uh, an employed person that has very minimal outgoings will be able to borrow. A, 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 that's kind of your gold standard mm. of, of borrowing capacity. Yeah, so things like childcare, personal loans, personal credit, loans cards, credit cards. 
So we also talked about stamp duty. Yeah. What is it? Stamp duty. It's a tax. It's a tax by the government. Boot to taxes. Uh, Okay, so stamp duty, history lesson, guys. Uh, Stamp duty uh, was first... Well, they they have a record of it from the 7th century in Spain. (laughs) Right, really? 17th century in Spain. And essentially, (laughs) it's a tax that you pay when you buy a house. (coughs) Not when you sell a house, when you buy a house. Stamp duty, it's a cost that you need to have money for up front. You can't borrow it, so you can't go to the bank and go, please, can I have my mortgage, but also money for stamp duty. So when you're looking at saving for your deposit or your fees, that's a really big piece. Yeah. The important part about stamp duty is it changes. It changes a lot. The reason it changes a lot is because of governments. So uh, it's a very, very big vote winner. So you'll often find uh, governments with manifestos will come out and they'll be reducing stamp duty or they'll be charging more stamp duty for evil buy-to-let landlords. So it, it flexes a lot, but it is a cost that you need to understand so as it stands at the moment, depends when you're watching this, yeah. stamp duty's first-time buyers isn't payable up to 425000 yeah. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, but that is due to change soon. Whether yeah. it does or not, we'll, we'll see. And that is just for first-time buyers that yeah. don't own any property, not just in the UK, but internationally. So even if you own part of a farmhouse in somewhere else, you're, you're not eligible for that stamp duty holiday. Yeah. Talk me through the mortgage process then. I've, I've spoken to you first of all. Yeah. I know how much I can borrow. I've got my deposit. What's the process? What? How does it work? So the process would be, we've had our chat. I've told you what you can borrow. I've told you how much it's going to cost. I've broken down all of those fees and that process. And you've gone, right, okay, so I want to start looking for a house. Happy days. So most cases I will do something called apply for an agreement in principle for you. Mm. Uh, What that is, it's a soft credit check with a bank so that I've done a a soft credit check in the background to check your credit files looking okay. That agreement in principle, some people don't get them. I tend to like my first time buyers definitely to have them just because it makes me check there's nothing dodgy in the Mm. background or if I need to do a fix on something, I can do it. Once I've got that off you go, register with the state agents. So you've got your online property portals, you've got your Zoopla on the market and right move, get those registered. I would always advise my clients to set up a bespoke email address when they're looking for a house. So it would be stewmontyhouse at outlook.com. The reason is you get a lot, lot, lot of notifications. That's a really good idea. A lot of notifications, <laughs> yeah. but also there's something called buyer's remorse, which when you move into your house, <laughs> if you haven't <laughs> deleted that account, suddenly you get something loads cheaper that's next door <laughs> so it gives you easy access to get all of the properties but yeah. also you can just switch it off else it becomes quite quite a lot you go out you do your viewings uh i think there's validation in keeping it old school going and seeing and sitting face to face with your definitely. local estate agents once you've identified where you want to live uh get to know them stay in really good contact with them uh and then you go do viewings uh viewings the average number of viewings for somebody to buy a house is seven Some people it's one, some people it's 50, but the average number is seven. Uh, Once you've done a viewing and you like the property, I would generally then ask you to give me a shout about it. We'll chat about it. What are the pros? What are the cons? Mm. I might have some questions that you need to ask an estate agent. You then put an offer in. That offer either gets rejected or accepted. Once it gets accepted, then you instruct your solicitors and you apply for your mortgage. So mortgage application, let's yeah, go. Go for it. So mortgage uh, mortgage application. So I sit down, I talk you through the mortgage that I'm recommending for you. I go through all of the terms and conditions. You understand it. You ask lots of questions. Once you're fully comfortable with it, we'll do the mortgage application. So at that point, I do, uh, I, it's called keying, keying. We key a mortgage <laughs> application, which goes off to the lender. I supply documentation, which will be your ID, so we know who you are, mm-hmm. your income, so we can work out what you can borrow, but also your outgoings, which is normally three months bank statements. Some banks, it's six. Um, that all goes to somebody called an underwriter. An underwriter is a person that literally sits there and goes through your documents and either agrees to lend you the money or not. Uh, <laughs> but generally, I've done my homework, hopefully, so yeah. hopefully yeah. then. At the same, so once that's happened, you are called underwritten. So you you have been agreed as a person to to, to borrow the money. But you're buying a asset, you're buying a house in this case. So what also needs to happen is an independent value will be instructed by the bank to go round to the property to check it's worth what you're what you're paying for it. Yeah. 
Once that survey or valuation is back and you have been underwritten, your mortgage offer is produced. And that mortgage offer sits there in the background with your funds reserved, with your rate reserved for normally six months while all of your legal work is being done. Then you do something called exchange. So this is in England. Exchange is the first point that you can legally, that you're legally bound to buy the house Mm. and the seller is legally bound to sell the house. That normally takes three months, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. Um, But up until that point in England, anyone can pull out of the transaction. So I personally would say for my client base, it's probably about three in 10. Don't go from having an offer accepted to to completion. Right. That can be for several things. Uh, There's a problem with the mortgage, hopefully Mm. not. Legal reasons, there might be some something that your solicitor pulls up or actually decides you don't like the house, you don't want to buy it, Mm. or the vendor decides they don't want to sell it. So there's there's quite a lot of emotion going on because when you're buying a house, it's not just... You're not just buying an asset, you're buying a home and you picture what it's going to be like to live in and you put shelves up and you go to Ikea and work out colour schemes on your Pinterest board (laughs) and all of that fabulous stuff. people still use Pinterest? Uh, Yeah, maybe. I think so. (laughs) I don't know. I'm like, I'm the wrong generation for Pinterest. I'm like a bit too old, but like, (laughs) yeah. Um, And maybe TikTok, snap. So exchange is basically the first time you legally have to buy the house and the vendor has to sell you the property. And then normally a week later you complete, which is when you actually have to start paying your mortgage and you get the keys to the property. Mm. So it's quite long, isn't it? Like three plus months is quite a long process. Yeah, it is. So that's why I sometimes describe my job as being like 50% financial advisor and 50% counsellor because it's so emotive. Buying a house is such an emotional Mm. thing and it's long and there's bumps in the road. Mm. Like there's no such thing, sadly, as a smooth property transaction because lots of there's so many different moving parts from solicitors, from finance to the actual bricks and mortar to you as people and you as clients and your changes over the time. So it's, you know, you need somebody on your team. Yeah. So a lot of people ask me, actually, what does a broker do? And you you said then very eloquently that, you know, you're part advisor, part counsellor. Yeah. But why should I go to a broker? So most people go use a broker now. Uh, uh, b- bank branches are disappearing, sadly or not sadly, depending on what camp you're in. Um, so it's, so there, there, there used to be a, a theory that you'd go to your bank and sit down with your mortgage advisor. Yeah. Fab if that's what you want to do, but a mortgage broker myself, I have access to all of the different banks, all of the different building societies, specialist lenders, international banks, private banks, banks you've never heard of. And my job is to get you the right mortgage and the cheapest mortgage. So there are many, many different types of mortgage in this world. Repayment, interest only, SVR, fixed. It's only once I've spent a really good Mm. amount of time with you, got to know you, what you're like, your attitude towards risk, your family set up, how long you want to be in the house for, what's going on with your job. It's only then once I've got to know you, plus your asset, which is the house and what your goals for that are, that I can then go to all of those different banks who all offer many different types of mortgage and recommend you that right mortgage, Mm -hmm. which is why you use a broker. Okay. And so what I think we'll do, Stu, if you come back, back onto the couch, we'll do it. We'll do a separate one just around exactly that, those different types of mortgage around fixed, track, and variable, all that. We'll try and deconstruct those for people. I'll check my diary. Check your diary. I know you're very busy, but there are a couple of points I did want to just pick up on. Um, We spoke about getting a credit score. We spoke about if you're employed, you have uh, pay slips, etc. What about people who are watching this who might think, actually, I've checked my credit score and it's not as good as it as it should be? Can can I still get a mortgage? And also, what about self-employed people or contractors who are watching this and go, well, actually, I don't have... Is it is it more difficult for me to get a mortgage? Credit score is generally a sales thing used by the credit reference agencies to get you paying for premium, to get you logging back in because your score will go up and down ever so microscopically. And look, oh, now mm. I can get a mortgage because my score's going up five points. Actually, what I'm really interested in is your credit file. I want to have a look yeah. at what's going on. Have you got a couple of missed payments? Is it a big deal? Maybe Maybe not, maybe so. But the whole reason about using many, many different banks is that everyone's got appetites for different things. So even if you've had some major blips, let's call them blips, in your credit file, there will be a bank that's right for you. There will be a bank that can lend Mm. to you. Very, very rarely do you see it where somebody's credit file is so irrepaired that 
you can't get lending. Yeah. It just might be a bit more expensive, but mm. that's kind of my job. So worry less about your score and more about how your credit file is looking. Have you got a good, is it all correct? And have you got a good chunk where you've been responsible with your repayments? Self-employed. It used to be that everyone was employed and the world has a change. Yeah. Uh, we've got direct contractors, we've got fixed term contracts, we've got uh, sole traders, we've got limited companies, we've got LLPs and everything else. Um, essentially, it's no more difficult for you to get a mortgage. What can be more tricky is working out your affordability because it's not as a simple a metric as somebody employed. But even with one year's self-employed accounts, I can get you a mortgage. There right. are lenders out there that will consider you. I think a common misconception is that you need three years worth of, of filed yeah. company accounts. And it's, it's too old school. Mm. It doesn't work like that anymore. A lot of people you find might have suddenly got to their sort of, um, they, they might have reached a certain level in their careers. And actually, they want to go freelance. They want to go day rate contractors. They want that flexibility. As a day, rate, day one day rate contractor, we can now get you a mortgage. Mm. No, it's good. And so as a self-employed, it's a, a skill of you and as a broker to find out exactly, it, will this lender lend on your net profits? Will they take retained profits yeah. into account, etc.? Salary, dividends, yeah. someone look at your day rate contractor. Yeah. So, so there's many, many more metrics that banks can use. Yeah. Okay. It's been very enlightening, Stu. I've really enjoyed myself. Thank oh, good. you. Good. I'm glad. Um, so let's finish off then. What are your sort of, your 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 best top tips for people who are just starting on the process who might be watching this. Top uh, tips are check your credit file. If you don't have a credit card, take a credit card out, spend a little bit every month, set up a direct debit and clear it in full. Because essentially, if you show you're responsible with borrowing and paying back little bits of money the day you come to apply for a mortgage, you're going to have had a track record. Definitely speak to a mortgage broker. Uh, Corico. Um, and just make sure you understand it. The first transaction you do, if you can get your head around it, have somebody that can teach you all about it, understand the mortgage, understand what solicitors do, understand how estate agents work. It sets you up because then you're so mm. much more familiar with it, whether it's a remortgage or a house move, you know what you're doing. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've really enjoyed our time. Thank you. I hope you guys have enjoyed it too. Um, join me next time back on the Corico couch. <laughs>